Eleanor and I would like to share some ideas with you from chapter one, just to, to hit on uh, some key concepts uh, from that chapter. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And we'll start out with this message. What do media mean? And that sentence might, might sound a little bit odd to you. What do media mean instead of what does media mean? <laughs> and we go through all the slides very quickly. Thanks, to Eleanor. All right. So uh, what do media mean? And the reason why it's do media instead of what does media mean is because media is a plural word. The word media means every book, every website, every movie, every TV show, every radio station and song, uh, every social media post, all of it is media. It literally is billions of things. So anytime somebody says the media is, whatever it is they're saying, that's wrong. So for example, someone might say the media is biased against Kentucky. Well, there might be examples of individual parts of the media that are biased against Kentucky. There might be a TV show that has a character who's from Kentucky and they depict them as a very stereotypical type of hick or whatever. Uh, I saw a website once that had this joke in it. How many Kentuckians does it take to eat a possum? Three. One to eat it and two to watch for cars. That's obviously a very anti-Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky uh, bias type of uh, joke. And so, yes, there are individual examples within the media that are biased against Kentucky, but it, it's not that all the media is. So all you can never say that the media is because it just never is one single entity. It's, it's literally billions of different things. All right, so one of the reasons why becoming media literate is such an important skill to develop is accelerating growth. More information has been generated since you were born than the sum total of all information throughout all recorded history up until the time of your birth. And that's a pretty profound statement and it is absolutely true. So uh, that gives you an idea of how much is being generated. The total amount of information generated doubles each year. So not only is it enormous, it's getting so much bigger all the time. And just a couple of examples, and there's more of these in your, in your book in chapter one, but uh, one example is that there are over 1,500 books published every day. Another example is with YouTube. Over 300 hours of video content is uploaded to YouTube every minute. Okay, so you could spend your whole life watching YouTube, which I don't recommend, but you could spend your whole life watching YouTube and you would only see a very tiny fraction of all the video that's on there. Also, this idea, the largest amount of information is created by ordinary people. And this is a relatively new change to media. Up until the time of the internet, this wasn't the case. Uh, before then, it was only people who you know, work at TV stations, people who make movies, people who work at radio stations, people who work for newspapers or magazines that uh, generated media. Now, because we have the technology to do so, most of it is actually created by ordinary people. And because there is so much media out there, it tends to push us towards something called automatic processing or automaticity. Automaticity is a state where our minds operate without any conscious effort from us. So we actually encounter most media messages on automatic pilot that we don't pay a lot of attention to, that you might have the TV on or the radio on or whatever, and, and you're just really not giving it uh, your attention. And we filter out almost all messages with little or no effort until something triggers our conscious attention. So a good way to think about this is think about when you're scrolling through your Twitter feed or uh, your Facebook, if you use Facebook, um, we tend to just pass things up very automatically. You know, oh, that's an ad. Um, that's about a topic that I don't care about. That's from somebody I don't really like or whatever. And then we might see something that catches our attention. Oh, this is about uh, a movie that I really like or about uh, a music group that I like or a restaurant that I care about or, or an issue that's important to me or whatever. And so we do that uh, in a very automatic way. And this is often part of multitasking. So uh, a lot of times, uh, well, first of all, multitasking is something that we do a lot more of than uh, people used to do. And part of that is uh, because we're just so saturated with media. So it's not uncommon for 
uh, someone to be listening to music while they're doing a task. You might watch TV and be using your phone at the same time. So multitasking has uh, increased significantly. And there may be some advantages to that, but there's also serious disadvantages. And, and there's a discussion board for this week where we're going to talk more about that. All right. Some advantages of automatic processing is it helps us make decisions with little effort that uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about, is this something I really want to pay close attention to or, or isn't it? We, we can just quickly filter through, uh, you know, whatever uh, we want to read or whatever we watch, whatever we want to listen to and so forth. Uh, it helps increase efficiency. I mean, if you had to take time to scrutinize every uh, possible TV show you could watch or every book you could read or whatever, you really, you couldn't do it because you just wouldn't have time. So it makes it a lot more efficient for us and it protects us from information overload. Because again, if you tried to, to consume all of it mentally, it would just overwhelm you and be very unpleasant. But there's certainly disadvantages to it as well. One is that we expose ourselves to more messages so we pay less attention to each. Because we're uh, paying attention to so many different things, uh, a great deal of time we really don't pay very much attention to whatever message it is that we're taking in. And so we're less likely to learn from any one message. So there might be something that you would want to learn from. A uh, simple example would be you might have the radio on while you're at home and you're not really paying attention to it. And there might be some really important information about some bad weather that's going to be coming up. And if you're not really paying close attention to it, you might miss out on that. We might miss out on helpful or enjoyable messages. So think about scrolling through all the recommended programs that come up on Netflix. You might just quickly, you know, look, oh, that picture just doesn't look interesting to me. Go on to the next one, the next one. And you might miss something that, that you really would find enjoyable. So there's, there's a definite disadvantage. And then there's this. Media messages can have more influence on us and even program us because of that automatic processing or that automaticity. That, uh, that may seem a little bit contradictory to you, but the reason for that is since we're not giving it our full attention, we're much less likely to scrutinize those messages. We're much less likely to use our critical thinking skills. Let me try to illustrate this uh, with an example. This is a 30 second commercial for diamond engagement rings. It's made by De Beers, uh, diamond ring company. So there's not a lot of information in that commercial. It's not talking about any sales that they're having. It doesn't tell you any locations of jewelry stores. It's just reinforcing this idea that is uh, so prevalent in our culture that if you want to ask someone to marry you, you should have a diamond engagement ring to give to them. And that's not something that you have to do. It's, it's a choice. Um, and so people are using other gemstones, other types of jewelries. Some people aren't using jewelry at all. You could use tattoos if you wanted to. Uh, you know, th there's many different things you can choose from. But they would like us to have this idea that this is just absolutely a must. If you're going to do that, you, that's the way to do it. And also there's this idea that they put near the end of the commercial. How else could two months salary last forever? If you look at advertising for diamond engagement rings, this idea has been around for many decades. The idea that when you get to when you go to buy a, a diamond engagement ring, the way you gauge what ring you should buy is you should buy one in the price range that's equivalent to two months of your salary. And so they would really like this idea to, to just be something that we accept, that, that it's programmed into us, that that's the amount of money that we're going to uh, pay on an engagement ring. And it doesn't have to be that. Uh, in fact, the diamond industry is, is uh, kind of deceptive in that diamonds are actually much more common than they would like us to realize. They just control the supply so they can keep the price up. And again, they try to sell us on this idea of, you know, regarding diamond engagement rings and, and uh, diamonds in general. So getting back to this idea of automaticity, um, they would like to be able to program us to have that idea. And if that commercial were to come on while you were also eating lunch or doing something else, you might hear it and, and not really pay a lot of attention to it. And you might get exposed to it uh, time and time again. And eventually it may help 
you know, program the idea that, yeah, uh, if you get married, you have to have an engagement ring and you should spend too much salary to buy it. And uh, it's just not the case. They're, they're trying to, to feed that idea to us. So again, automatic processing or this automaticity, uh, one of the big disadvantages is, is uh, media can actually have more influence on us when we uh, take things in automatically. That's an important idea and one that uh, will be uh, part of other chapters that we'll be reading in the future. So that's a quick look at some key ideas uh, from chapter one, and thank you.